Um, I'm an archaeologist and a reconstruction artist, and I mostly produce visualisations for um, kind of general audience outreach. Um, as a reconstruction artist, I'm guided by a responsibility to remain faithful to the excavated evidence. Um, paired with the need to capture my audience's attention and imagination. <coughs> in terms of my research, I'm really interested in exploring the ways that archaeologists make, engage with, and share archaeological reconstruction. And um, as often as I can, I kind of try and take a step back from uh, my own practice um, just to try and make sense of what I'm doing and why. Someone who's been very helpful in picking apart, um, oh, sorry, I should have. That was me. <laughs> so someone who has been very useful in uh, picking apart the inner workings of my often kind of messy practice is my friend and fellow archaeologist, uh, Dr. Barry Maxwell, who unfortunately can't be here today, and this was the only picture I could find of her online. And she's not here at some point. <laughs> um, the idea for this paper really came together after a couple of conversations between myself and Barry. Um, after she joined the team at the V&A Dundee, um, which is Scotland's very first design museum, we're all very excited. Um, as archaeologists, I think that on some level, it's just very natural to want to analyse our practices into a coherent methodology. But the influence of, kind of leaving my double life in an art school has made me reluctant to deny the um, maybe the more intangible sides um, to what I do, um, the, the field as a whole, I kind of get a sense tends to shy away from. Um, so it was during one of these kind of identity crisis rants that I was having with Vary um, that she offered the observation that what I do really has all the makings of approaching the production of my reconstructions as though each were its own little design challenge. So it's really the exploration of that idea that I'm going to be talking about today. So um, I didn't think that I could present in a session about creative disruption um, without at least giving a nod to a collaborative short film that I made back in 2013 with um, Kieran Baxter and uh, Aaron Watson called Digital Dwelling at Scarabray. Um, the film itself is an experiment in challenging audience perception and engagement with the more intangible sides to uh, interpretation. Um, it is online if you want to watch it, if you just search for Digital Dwelling, but um, just from that little clip there, uh, rest assured that the film suitably weirded people out, um, which we were absolutely delighted about. Um, but it did something else too. In challenging what people were used to seeing on heritage sites, the feedback revealed a series of assumptions made by audiences about what this kind of imagery can and should do. Very degree of uncertainty within the imagery that we produce, paired with the authoritative context in which they're often presented, means that I think we've kind of inadvertently created a culture of misplaced preconceptions about these images. So if we think about this for a second, in an art gallery, we would tend to wear our analytical thinking caps because we're used to these images and these artworks being open to interpretation. Whereas in a museum, we go in expecting to be told things. And I think this breeds a kind of passive engagement that I don't think fairly reflects the nature of this type of imagery. And by treating subjectivity and visualisation as a negative to be avoided, we're just fighting a battle that we can never win against the very nature of interpretation itself. So, what are we to do about all this archaeological baggage? This is my actual archaeological baggage from fieldwork. I'm a visual person. <laughs> um, so, as I said, archaeologists seem to feel this constant pressure to quantify creative work, which is really difficult to do when it's framed in the same way as archaeological practice itself. Obviously, we have best guides, like the London Charter, but personally, I've just never really found that these work well for the kinds of imagery that I produce. The concept of paradata, of course, is brilliant for academics producing visualisations for other academics, but it doesn't translate to the production of imagery for wider audiences. So essentially, when my reconstructions fly the nest, they're on their own. So my hope 
is that in considering archaeological visualisation as design practice, we can address this issue on two levels. Firstly, we give ourselves a better framework to talk about the visualisation process, which is more tangible and easier to engage with for the wider field, and maybe just makes it less of a mystery for people who aren't maybe makers themselves. Secondly, I'm hopeful that it can also help us change the way that we make and present interpretive visualisation in archaeology, addressing some of these recurring issues through the imagery itself. Um, so these are a couple of diagrams that uh, Barry actually showed me from Stanford University, um, and she tells me that they're the guys that really know their stuff when it comes to design, so we like these diagrams a lot. Um, I particularly like the non-linear one, because um, it kind of reflects my like messy thinking a bit more, and it's kind of an infinite loop, which um, yeah, kind of seems, seems very sensible for my process. Um, but we also like them because they're not super product or commercially focused, um, as you get with a kind of a lot of design thinking. Um, but they give due consideration to the process of co-production between the maker or makers, stakeholders, and users. And as I said in this diagram, I see a lot of parallels with my own process. I see research. I see collaboratively establishing content, uh, intent and what story that we want to tell. Um, I see um, kind of exploring the former um, on the second side of the diagram through practice, through making and through a cycle of feedback. <coughs> Crucially for me, a design firm framework makes space for creativity and it engages with the more subjective elements of decision making and it's characterised as innovation. Design considers the weight of visual language, whereby the medium itself influences how the message is received. Um, so this is the medium as a message um, kind of ideal. Um, but anyway, I'm a practice-based researcher, so when I'm posed with a problem, I like to make things. So permit me to demonstrate through a case study. Um, so this is a project that I'm currently working on, and um, I'm building an educational resource for school children which brings together the multivocal narratives surrounding the excavation of a pre-contact Yupik sod house in Alaska. In terms of stakeholders, as well as the archaeologists digging the site, we have the elders in the community who are concerned about a lack of interest in Yupik culture from the younger generations, and just a subsequent feeling of estrangement from the more traditional ways of life. Um, the archaeological material is highly valued as an important point of engagement for Yupik culture, especially in the context of continuing a, traditional in, uh, sorry, a tradition of intergenerational teaching, and also as a node for cultural creativity. Um, so it's with these considerations in mind that the resource has been designed around an interactive interface which uses oral storytelling as a core method for knowledge dissemination. So this is some of the concept art from the kind of pre-production phase. Um, and it's got lots of little details through it, but I'll take you through a couple of examples just now. So in terms of the overall design of the interface, um, you pick, say, that if you make beautiful things, you will have a good life. And we see that all the time in archaeology. Every little spoon, every bowl, every dart, every beautiful decoration on it, you'll excavate something and kind of rub away the mud and be like, oh hello, and there'll be a little face on it. It's just everything has so much attention to detail. So with this in mind, um, we adopted a 2D traditional frame-by-frame -frame animation style for the characters. So I'm working on those with um, fantastic character animator Tom Paxton. Um, he's doing the people and I'm dealing with the animals. Um, and I also adopted a hand-painted look for the backdrop, so although they start off as kind of a 3D modelling process, I'm going and finishing everything by hand. And these are mediums which I hope kind of reflect these UPIC values. Um, I've also designed some of the animated animal characters to look like the masks that we find on site. Um, to do this, I spent a lot of time actually sketching the masks themselves and other decorated artefacts that we find to kind of begin to try and understand the lines that you pick artists from. Um, and this is also following feedback that some of the early characters should kind of look less Disney and more you pick. 
Um, and I'm also working with local artists in Quinnahawk, which is the town that uh, the dig's on in, um, on some scrimshaw designs for some of the interactive uh, pages within the interface as well. All these little details of the design present something that the local kids can look at and just not see some generic style, but something that I hope they feel represents them and their Yupik heritage in a positive way. So not in the negative stereotyping that their generation has unfortunately come to associate with Native Alaskan culture. Um, so as an example here, I also wanted to show a more traditional reconstruction from the interface. Um, just to demonstrate how even without all the bells and whistles of interaction, we can still design audience experience just with a still image. Um, so this is the interior uh, of the, the sod house that we've been excavating. Um, so with this image, I'm thinking about the end users, I'm thinking about the kids and the school teachers who are going to use this resource. So I've used light and shadow to guide the eye through the image and pick out important artefacts that I know the teachers will be using in the classroom um, kind of as part of their lessons. Um, so last little example here, um, I've also done quite a bit of work uh, structured light scanning a lot of the Nunalit collection. Um, including a lot of the masks that we find. These masks would originally have been uh, decorated with lots of attachments and painted in quite distinct styles. So the page that we're designing for this, um, with John Anderson, who's doing all our programming, um, this will allow the kids to actually paint directly onto the 3D masks and interpret their own designs. Um, they're going to, as they're doing this, um, because of the kind of oral history uh, element to the interface, they're going to be hearing narratives from the archaeologists, talking about their interpretations, um, you know, when we excavate a mask, what does that feel like, what does it mean, how do we interpret it? Um, we're going to be hearing from the elders in the village who, um, well, a lot of people uh, from the village dig with us anyway, but the elders come down and visit and they're really, really helpful in identifying things. But when I was making this page, I was thinking of uh, John Smith in particular, who comes down to the site a lot to see what we've been finding. And any time we find a mask, he sits back and he'll go, mm, these people, these people danced a lot. And I love that. And all that's going to be in there too. Um, we're also going to hear from uh, Drew Michael, um, who came to dig with us for a couple of weeks as well. And Drew is a contemporary mask carver from Anchorage. And he's going to be choosing about, uh, sorry, he's going to be talking about how he chooses his designs and his colours in his masks today. And so you people don't really make a differentiation as we do between the past and the present. So it's very much a continuation from the ancestors to today. Um, so bringing in people like Drew, I think, is an important node in facilitating contemporary engagements alongside the archaeological narratives. And so I'm probably running out of time, so I will conclude now. Um, archaeological visualisation is not just about making pretty pictures. This imagery has agency and it has intent. Design connects creativity and innovation, and it's characterised by similar attributes to the interpretive process in archaeology. Collaboration, intention, discovery and experimentation. As a maker and an archaeologist, I think sometimes it's really difficult to be both inside and outside my field of inquiry. And it's through doing and making that you understand things on a deeper level that's maybe not always easy to articulate. But as I'm starting to think about this idea of archaeological visualisation in the context of design, it's really helped me hopefully start to see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm hoping to develop this a bit more. Interested to see what you think. Um, skeptical dog will take any questions. <laughs> <laughs>